So Zechariah chapter 1, if you have it in the word of the Lord, say amen. amen. <clears throat> All right, amen. I'm going to start with verse 7, and I will read through verse 17. Amen. amen. Now, while you are turning there, I will tell you that on YouTube, <clears throat> Bible Center Fellowship Odessa, or BCF Odessa YouTube channel, there is a microscope, a microscopic teaching on Zechariah. That means detailed teaching. And then there is another teaching that is telescopic. That means it's, a, it's an overview of the prophet. And the overview of the prophet Zechariah is in the minor prophet series. The microscopic teaching of Zechariah is a playlist called Zechariah. So we've spent a lot of time in preaching the prophet Zechariah to you probably more uh, from Zechariah than any other minor prophet, okay? And I'll explain that to you as we get going through here, all right? All right, verse 7. If you have it, say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Upon the 4th and 20th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Sabbath, that'd be January, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Ido, or Ido the prophet, saying, <clears throat> I saw by night... And behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom. And behind him were three red horses, speckled and white. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are they whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro through the earth. And the answer of the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth. Behold, all the earth sitteth still and, and is at rest. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation three, three score and ten years? And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the angel that come commune with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy, and I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line, a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. We thank you for your awesome presence in this house tonight. We ask, God, that your will would be done in and through us, that you ultimately would be glorified, that you ultimately would be honored in this house. Lord Jesus, we thank you for everything that you will do. We praise you in advance. We depend upon your spirit. We thank you for your word. And everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated in the name of the Lord. The prophet Zechariah is the apocalyptic prophecy of the Old Testament. And you might say it this way so you'll understand how important the prophet Zechariah is. It is like the book of Revelation in the New Testament. It is the book of Revelation in the Old Testament. That's how significant the prophet Zechariah is. And the reason why it's so similar to the book of Revelation is because it is apocalyptic writing. Okay. Amen. Now, apocalyptic writing simply means this. It's a book of visions and signs. Amen. Amen. So there's signs here. There's visions here. There's symbols here. There are angels in the prophecies. Amen. There is a prophecy of the coming of the Lord. Amen. There is a prophecy of judgment. 
uh, and, and things like that. So when you have prophecy that deals with all that kind of symbolism and angels and, and visions and the coming of the Lord and what's going to happen in future events, that's why it's called apocalyptic prophecy. Amen. Apocalypse means revelation, Amen. but it's a specific kind of revelation. So when we look at Zechariah, then we are looking at the book of Revelation for the Old Testament. You cannot understand the book of Revelation, the book of the Apocalypse, without understanding the book of Zechariah. It is the key prophecy of the Old Testament that gives you understanding of the New Testament book of Revelation. And you might say, well, I believe the book of Daniel is the key. Well, it is a key, a key. But Zechariah is the key to understand the book of Revelation. So that's why we have spent so much time in, in teaching and preaching it to you. The title of the message tonight is going to be this, Myrtles in the Valley. Myrtles in the Valley. The theme is going to be victory. I'm telling you tonight by the Spirit of God that there is victory in the house. There is victory in the church. And God wants every individual to walk in that victory. But as far as the house is concerned, as far as the church is concerned, there is victory in this house. Say praise the Lord. So we're going to study just a little bit about those victories in the prophet Zechariah. Give you a little background here. Uh, when you look at the book itself, you see the coming of the king. Amen. In Zechariah 9 9, it talks about his first coming. He's going to come riding on uh, a colt, the foal of an ass. Amen. 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 Zechariah 9, his first coming. Amen. We see the rejection of the king in chapter 11, 12, and 13. Hey, are you with me? Amen. We see the second coming of the king in chapter 14, verses through, uh, 3 through 8. And then catch this, we see the victories, say the victories of the king in 9 and 8, 12, 1 through 14. Amen. All right, say amen. amen. Now to give you a little bit of a, an overview very quickly here, if you want to break up the book and divide it correctly as far as teaching, the first eight chapters, there are eight slash ten visions now, I'm not going to try to explain why there might be eight and why there might be ten. If you want that, go and look at the, the teaching in depth, all right? Amen. But there's eight to ten visions that God gives this prophet Zechariah in a 24-hour period. Amen. Can you imagine that? Just one vision after another that comes from God in, in 24 hours. I, God is really speaking powerfully uh, to this prophet at this time. Amen? Amen. And so the first eight chapters, really it's the six chapters, you're going to see those eight to ten visions. But the first eight chapters is God is encouraging His people who are depressed. He is discouraging His people who are discouraged. Or encouraging His people who are discouraged. They're back in their land and God is going to say to them, you're back in the land. But you haven't finished building. Amen. So you, you've come out of captivity. You've come out of your failure. You've come out of your defeat. You've come out of your past. And so now it's time to build. And so God raises up two prophets. One by the name of Haggai and the other is Zechariah. Haggai is the older prophet. Zechariah is the younger prophet. Two months after Haggai finishes his prophecy, the Bible tells us about, in verse 7, the prophecy of Zechariah begins to come forth. Again, two months after Haggai finishes his prophecy. Amen, amen. They work as a tandem. They work as a team to encourage the people of God. Amen. Haggai comes. He's got fire in his eyes. Hallelujah. He's preaching about judgment because the people are neglecting the house of God. And so he's telling them why you're having economic problems in your life is because you have neglected the house of God. If you would correct that, then prosperity would come back to you. He said, but your house is full of mildew and you've got a bag with holes in it because you have neglected the house of God. 
And you're not building it like you should. And so he said, go up into the mountains and, and bring wood down from the mountains and build the house of God. And, and so he comes with fire, if you will, to encourage the people of God. And it's, it's a message of judgment, but Haggai is talking to them and encouraging them and saying, hey, you need to build right now because there's a future glory coming. You need to prepare for that future glory. And so at the end of his prophecy, the last thing that he says is that there's going to be an overthrow of false authority. Amen. Satanic authority is going to be defeated. God is going to have victory over Satan's authority. It is a false authority that God is going to get the victory over through Jesus Christ. The true authority is the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus himself. And right after that, Right after that declaration of the downfall of false authority, Amen. God victory has victory over false authority. Amen. Two months later, this prophet begins to receive visions from God. Zechariah is a little bit different in his approach. He's an encourager, but he also goes back to the past. Amen. And he tells them in the first few verses, the first six verses of chapter 1, he tells them this is the reason why you lost the glory in the past. This is the reason why, are you understanding, you went into captivity. So he talks about that for just a little bit. And then he tells them, he says, don't be like your daddies. Amen. You read the verse in the Bible said, God sent prophets to your fathers and your fathers would not hear them. God sent prophets to your daddies and your daddies did not listen to them. And so as a result of them closing their ears, to the word of God. Then the Bible says judgment came upon them. Amen. And so he's speaking to the generation. The children of those parents. Amen. And he says don't be like your daddy. Amen. Don't be like your parents. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And fail. You need to hear the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So he's trying to encourage them to get to building. To do the work of God. By showing them what happened in the past. And he's telling them, don't repeat what happened in the past. Because if you do, you're going to lose the glory. You're going to lose, hallelujah, the things that are important in your life. Say praise God. So we see as we break it down, then we go from there. And we go into visions for all the way from verse 7 to chapter 6. And then 7 and 8, we see a delegation of people with a question about fasting and prayer. And then beginning verse 9 and 10 and 11, we have judgments upon the nations of this world. And then chapter 12 through 14, we have the future glory of the nation of Israel itself. Hallelujah. But tonight I'm going to focus on one particular vision. And it's going to be spiritual application. Amen. I'm not going to talk to you a lot about how it's going to be literally fulfilled in the nation of Israel in the future, etc. I'm going to talk to you in a spiritual application to believe what I, God is saying to us tonight in this place by way of a spiritual application to the church. Hallelujah. Say amen. amen. So I'm excited about what God is going to say amen. here tonight. So as I said in the first few verses, the prophet Zechariah trying to encourage the people to get busy to work for God. Amen. Break free from your distress, discouragement. Break free from your depression. Break free from your idleness. Break free from your loser mentality. Break free of that. And understand that God has brought victory to you. There is victory in this church right now, I tell you, by the Holy Ghost. And so we see the Bible says the prophecy comes to a man by the name of Zechariah. This is all important. Amen. Because Zechariah means the Lord will remember. remember. Zechariah is the son of Berechiah. Amen. Which means blessing or comfort. Amen. God says in the word by the prophet he said I'm coming and I'm remembering my people. And when I remember my people, I'm going to bless them and I'm going to what? Comfort them. Hallelujah. And then we see he's called the son of Ido, the prophet. And Ido means appointed time. 
So when you put those together, God is saying, I'm going to remember my people. I'm going to bless my people at the appointed time. Give God praise in the house. So he begins, amen, to speak to them. And I won't read every verse. But God says to them, if you will turn to me, I will turn to you. He said, I'm not going to leave you locked up in past failures. He lets them know right off in the first few verses that they're locked up in finality. That if they will change, if they will approach God and they will turn to God, God would turn to them. So out of the midst of failure, out of the midst of of defeat, if you will, this prophet rises up with victory in his voice. With a desire to encourage the people of God to get busy and to serve God. And eight to ten visions, one right after another. God gives this prophet to encourage the people of God and let them know victory is in the house. Even though you might have failed, God says there's still a future for you. Give the Lord praise in the house. We do understand though, I believe it's the third chapter, that Satan stood over against Joshua the high priest to accuse him. You have to understand that when God gets ready to bring a message of victory to you, there's always going to be the accuser in the brethren that's going to try to rise up and accuse the brethren. But God said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Hallelujah to the Lamb. There's always going to be some opposition to the victory that God is seeking to bring His house. But we have to recognize not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And it is God that takes the garments, the filthy garments, and replaces them with clean garments and rebukes the devil to his face. Give God praise in the house. And so this prophet begins to preach to them. Message of encouragement. Letting them know their failure is not final. I want you to hear it tonight, brothers and sisters. There is victory in this church. Victory, victory, victory. I hear victory, victory, victory. Victory, victory, victory. Oh, hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, victory, victory shall be mine. Now I'll say it this way, victory, victory is mine. In Jesus' name. By my God, by my God, in Jesus' name, by my God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight coming here to encourage you, let you know. Hallelujah, by God you shall run through a truth. By your God you shall leap over a wall. By your God you have victory, 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 in Jesus' name. Oh, the enemy will ever try to keep you down in past failures. But God is saying, no, there is a future beyond your failure. Victory, victory, victory is mine. In Jesus' mighty name, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. You are a liar. Give God praise in the house. And so as we, I'm going to get in the first vision in just a moment. But go to Zechariah 9. And let's see a victory. In verse 8, he said, I will encamp about my house because of the army, because of him that passeth by, and because of him that returneth. And no oppressor shall pass through them anymore. For now have I seen with my eyes. Give God praise in the house. God is declaring victory. He said there will be no more oppressor that shall pass through them anymore. For now have I seen with my eyes. Give God praise in the house. In the prophet Zechariah, God is the same yesterday, today, and ever, forever. What He can do in the past, He can do in the future. And what He can do in the past and the future, He can do in the present and the spirit. Don't limit God's prophetic word to some past or some future experience. Because in the spirit it's always today. 
Give God worship. I feel the power of God. If he can do it in the past, he can do it in the future, he can do it in the present. Give God worship. No more oppressors shall pass through him. Anymore for now have I, my eyes have seen. Give God worship. Now watch. In chapter 12, we see something powerful. Of course, this is a future prediction of the war of Armageddon that will take place. And again, the literal application of these verses you can learn in, on, on what I said as far as the YouTube channel, Bible Center Fellowship, yes, the teaching on Zechariah. But let me just look at these verses very quickly because they are teaching victory. Amen. Amen. So he said, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretched forth the, heavy, the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth and formeth the spirit of man within him. Think about how powerful this God is. What enemy should you be afraid of? What enemy could you be afraid of when you've got a God like this? The Bible said He stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and formed the spirit of man within Him. In verse 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Yeah, you may have enemies around you, but God says... Uh, I'm going to make them tremble. I'm going to make them tremble. When there's victory in the house, the enemy will tremble. You won't. The enemy will tremble. Verse 3. And in that day, of course, that's the future day of the Lord, the millennial kingdom. But right now we're in a spiritual day. In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces through though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, will I, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. Yeah. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength, the Lord of hosts their God. Watch, this is powerful. In that day, of course, in the future, it's talking about the kingdom age, but I'm talking about spiritually now. Will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the woods and like a torch of fire in a sheaf? What he's saying is this, is right now, he's going to put fire in your pan and you're going to carry that fire. That hearth, that pan, he's going to put fire in your pan and you're going to carry that fire and you're going to ignite something powerful. Oh, give God praise in the house. Oh, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf, they shall devour all the people round about in the right hand, and on the left, Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. God is amazing. So God has put a fire inside of you, brothers and sisters, today. That's all pictures of victory. Nine and eight. Twelve on, one and on. It's all victory. Now chapter, seven, uh, chapter one, verse seven, the first vision we see. Two months after the declaration of Haggai the prophet. You can read it. Hallelujah. The overthrow of false, uh, false authority is established by the prophet Haggai. And two months later, we see the prophet Zechariah brings this message of comfort. Amen. And so the Bible says that the word came unto Zechariah, verse 7. The son of Berechiah, the son of Idol, the prophet, the Lord remembers to bless in the appointed time. The word is coming to, from God for that. When does it happen? He says, I saw by night. Yes, sir. Now catch this tonight, brothers and sisters. He sees these visions of victory from God in the night season. That means it's a picture of distress. It's a picture of calamity. It's a picture of judgment upon the nations. But that's when God brings a message of victory to His church. And remember, this is after their failure that he brings this message of comfort 
and message of victory. It's after their failure that God speaks to them this way. Let me say it to you this way. And I know I'm talking fast. But you can hear fast. You don't get good and then get God. You get God, then you get good. And I preached it to you Sunday night. Amen. If you're so focused about behavior all the time, all you're going to think about is, how i got to get good, then I can get God. God said, no, you get God, then you get good. Amen. A lot of people are waiting to receive the Holy Ghost because they're trying to be good enough to get the Spirit of God. No, by the work of Jesus Christ on the Calvary's cross, the blood that was shed by Him makes you worthy to receive His Spirit. You get God, then you get good. You don't get good and then get God. And so God shows them after their failure that He is still with them. In a time of darkness, in a time of distress, in a time of calamity, if you will. Amen. Ooh, hallelujah to the Lamb. I feel the Holy Ghost. We know, many of us know what this is about. Many of us know what it's like to be in these times of, of darkness and calamity and stress and distress and all kinds of stuff. You know, we know what that's like. But God's got a message in the midst of that. Victory, victory shall be mine. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. So he sees it by night. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the stress. We're in those times right now. There's situations. I said there's situations that create darkness. But God steps in. Situations can't stop God. Darkness can't stop God. Distress can't stop God. God's going to speak. Mm, I feel the Holy Ghost. Oh, hear you hear, hear the word of God tonight. He said in that night time, Behold a man riding upon a red horse. Who is this man riding upon the red horse? The Bible tells us in chapter 11, uh, chapter, verse 11 and verse 12 that it's none other than the Lord of hosts. It's none other than God. Listen to me carefully. It's none other than the one God of the Bible. He's called the Lord of hosts. He's singular Lord. Host is plural. There's only one God. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. His name is Jesus. There's not two gods or three gods. There's only one God and His name is Jesus. He is the one God over the host of the angels. He is the one God over the host of the church. He is the one God over the host of Israel. He is the one God over the armies, the church, the angels, and Israel. There's only one God. And over 50 times in the prophet Zechariah is this term used, Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. I believe 18 times, 18 times the Lord of hosts is used in chapter 8 alone. So God is trying to show you to focus in that he's the Lord of armies. There's one God, his name is Jesus. But he's got a company of armies. And so this rider on the red horse is none other than the Lord of hosts or Yahweh, the Lord God. When you say Yahweh, say Jesus. Say Jesus. All oh, praise God. Amen. And so he's on a red horse. What does that mean? <laughs> See, the prophet seeing this red horse rider riding forth. It's not the red horse rider in the book of Revelation. This is the Lord of hosts. He's coming forth, and as the prophet watches, he can see a calvary behind the Lord of hosts. Of other horses riding with him. He's in charge of them. He's in charge of those horses. He's in charge of those spirit riders upon those uh, horses. Give God worship in the house. Amen. 
Verse 9, we see an interpreting angel. And then verse 11 and 12, we see the angel of the Lord is God Himself in a visible form. I said God Himself in a visible form. The interpreting angel is going to talk to Zechariah and explain to Zechariah what the vision is about. But I have to let you know, when you look at this prophecy, you've got one angel that's interpreting, then you've got another angel that's the angel of the Lord Himself. That's just a term that means God in visible form. An Old Testament theophany, if you will, of God. Amen. Give God praise. So he's seen riding forth on a red horse. I'm telling you, Jesus. The red speaks of the blood of Calvary. The red speaks of the blood shed for you at Calvary's cross. That you might have victory in your life. It also speaks of war, of might and war. So on the one hand, we have victory for the people of God by the blood of Jesus. On the other hand, we have war by the same Jesus against those who reject the gospel. Oh, I love you, Lord. But victory, 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 victory. So this prophet is letting them know. That the Lord is with them in a time of discouragement, in a time of darkness. The Bible says that this man riding upon a red horse stood among the myrtle trees. Say the myrtle trees. In verse 8, verse 10, verse 11, myrtle trees are seen there. Amen. This man on this red horse is now seen dismounted. And he's standing among these myrtle trees. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Let me read on a little bit to get some more detail here. It says that we're in the bottom. These myrtle trees were in the bottom. These myrtle trees were in the valley. These myrtle trees, the Hebrew word bottom, literally the Hebrew word is mitzlu, mitzlu, mitzla which means depth, hollow, place of shadows. The myrtles were in the place of shadows. The myrtles were in a hollow place. The myrtles were in a valley, if you will. I'm trying to help those of you who've been in a valley in your life. And it's not me, it's God trying to help you with the word tonight. You have been in a valley. You have been empty on the inside. You've been in a hollow place on the inside. You've been in a valley on the inside. You've been in a dark place. But God is there in the hollow place. He's there in the empty place. He's there, hallelujah, in the valley. Among the myrtles. You find the myrtles. In shadow land. Amen. You find the myrtles in the hollow place. You find the myrtles in the valleys. Amen. A lot of times when we're going through things in our life. And I've got to be careful as I preach that I don't over go too fast. And, and don't listen to God. What God wants to say to you as well. Amen. As he wants to interject things. But as you go through things in your life and you're in an empty place or a hollow place. And you're in a valley. You look at it and you just, you just don't know. You're in despair. And Amen. you're just in a, in a very dark place in your life. And and you're just so empty and uh, come on somebody so so full of despair and you, you don't you don't feel like you've got anything but God is saying that's not true that when you're in that place the Lord of hosts is with you when you're in that place there's myrtles in that place when you're in that empty place that hollow place what I'm trying to tell you is that you do have something with you and that's God and that's the myrtles. These myrtles then are a picture of that. Here they are. They don't get very big, but they get real bushy and they get full of white flowers. And, and what's amazing with these myrtles is that when they get bigger and they put forth white flowers and they put this bushy uh, top on them, about eight foot tall, they put forth the most beautiful fragrance you can ever imagine. Oh, come on, church. I'm not just preaching you a sermon. 
Because God is saying in your hollow place, in your valley place, in your dark place, God says, I can bring a fragrance from there. See, what you're going through right now was not meant to destroy you. What you're going through right now was meant for your good. It was meant to make you a better person. It was meant to help you in your walk with God. You say, even my failure, if you give it to God, God can turn it around. So myrtles in the low place. Now, if you're not in this place right now and, and you know, you're on the mountaintop, then you can probably just go home if you want to. No, sir. But I've been preaching long enough to tell, to know that we all go through those places in the hollow place. We all at times get empty. We all go through times of darkness. We all go through valleys. But God is saying, when you're there and you think you're by yourself, God says, no, I'm still with you. So the myrtle, beautiful fragrance. In case you don't know it, God is saying that's you. That's right, Pastor. That's me. That's right. In case you don't know it, He's saying this is Israel. That's right. That's right. In case you don't know it, He's saying this is you. You are the myrtles. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. You're the myrtles in that low place, that valley place, that hollow place. You're the myrtles that put forth a beautiful fragrance. You're the rare wood. That only grows in the nation of Israel. Maybe a few other places in the world. You're the rare wood. Hallelujah. Let me tell you brothers and sisters. You are rare. Yes. You think about all the people in Odessa, Texas. You are rare because you belong to God yes. himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in your valley you put forth the fragrance. In your valley God says I'm with you. In your valley God says you smell beautiful to me. So there's victory then in the valley. When you look at them, not only are they fragrant and rare because they belong to God, they also, because of their evergreenness, speak of resurrection. If they speak of resurrection, that means there was a death. And if you have a resurrection, you have victory over death. I want you to give God praise in the house. If you have an evergreen in the valley, when you feel like you're dying, God says, no, you're alive. You look at yourself one way, and God sees you another way. God sees you in, in victory. God sees you full of life. God sees you fragrant. You see yourself empty. You see yourself in a valley. You see yourself in a hollow place. God says, yeah, but you're a murder. Yes, yes, Fill with life. Fragrant. Sweet to God. Look at say sweet to God. Right now. Right now. Victory. And so the Bible says, this writer, the Lord of hosts, is there among the myrtle trees. He's with us tonight. Amen. He's a man of war on one hand. Hallelujah. He defeats his enemies. He brings victory. Calvary, if you will, was a war. But at Calvary, he won the victory over sin, death. And then when he rose from the grave, he rose and he got victory over sin, death. Hell in the grave. I feel the Holy Ghost in power in this place. Yes, there's many battles still ahead. But look for victory in every one of them. And as he's seen standing among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, behind him were three red horses speckled in white. And the Bible goes on and explain who these horses are. They are God's scouts That's right. that go throughout the earth. Amen. And they're checking out all the nations around the nation of Israel. And they're checking, amen, they know where God's people are and God knows where His people are. Right. But surrounding them is the nations of the world. Amen. And the scouts of God are going forth to see what is going out there. Of course, God knows everything. But they're going to bring back their report to God and tell them that the earth is still and at rest yes. right now. Amen. 
Give God praise. They're going to come back with a report to God, the Lord of hosts. The man on the red horse standing in the myrtle trees. And report to him and say, the land, the earth is rest. Is at rest, it's still and it rests. What he's saying is, is that right now there's peace. And because right now there is peace, get busy and build. Give God praise in the house. And as they looked at the nations around Israel, those nations didn't care anything about the people of God. They didn't care anything about the church of God. But God cared about them. God was with them. God was in the midst of them. Amen. And so they go forth and they go forth and they ride and they bring back this report. These supernatural beings, if you will, that are in control, if you will, of the things that go on in this planet. I will tell you, my God is in control. God is in control right now. He's aware of what's happening in the world. He's got supernatural beings that are going forth and bringing back a report, especially in relationship to His people. Are y'all understanding? He said the nations Amen. are at rest. Yes, sir. That's right. Amen. That's right. Amen. God is saying to Israel, now is the time to build. Oh, are you hearing the word of God? Look at your neighbor and say, it's time to build right now. Oh, I feel in the Holy Ghost. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. In about 6,000 years of man's history, do you realize that only about 200 years of that 6,000 years of man's history, that only about 200 years that there's actually been peace in the world? Most of the time, men are always fighting about something. That's the nature of man. They always want to fight about something. But God says as He goes out, sends those scout riders he said, there's peace. Now, I want you to see this right now. There's a lot here, but I'm not going to try to break it all down. But we've got a, we've got a red horse. Yes, we've got speckled horses. That means bay horses, like spotted. And then you've got white. Right? Amen? Yes, so we've got red that speaks of warring horses. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We've got the bay horses, the speckled horses, yes, which is a mixture of the, of the red and the white. So there's a mixture of war and there's a mixture of victory. You understand? The next horse is the white horse. And the white horse speaks of victory. Victory for God's people. Now, Pastor, you're preaching to me. This. I'm not getting this because you don't know what I mean. You don't know the battle I fought today. But nothing stops my God. And nothing stops your God from being in victory to his house. Thank you, Jesus. Now watch. Here we go. So we see this Calvary that's with the Lord. Verse 9 then said, I, oh my Lord, what are these? This is Zechariah speaking to the interpreting angel. And the angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these be. Amen? Amen. Isn't this amazing? We don't have to guess at it. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. God has sent them, not the devil. God has sent them Amen. throughout the earth. These horses represent then His power. Verse 11, And they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees. This is, again, the angel of the Lord is a term that speaks of God in manifestation. Amen. That stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth. And behold, the earth sitteth still and is at what? Rest. Rest. Yeah. And the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts. Now that's the interpreting angel. uh, Says to the Lord of hosts. That's the 
uh, angel of the Lord. Amen. Amen. O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Jerusalem against which thou hast had indignation, indignation these threescore and ten years? And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. Isn't that powerful? See, God has dealt with them in their failures, but now they've come back to the land. And God is saying, it's time for me to speak a message of comfort. It's a time for me to speak a message of mercy. Come on, give God praise. It's a time for me to speak victory in the house. Victory in the house. Victory beyond failures. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Oh, give God praise. Yeah, I know sometimes, and even at that time, Jerusalem was still suffering somewhat. And the rest of the world looked like they were doing pretty good. But God was with them. His God is with you. So bring some good words and some comfortable words. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Watch this. I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. See, he's letting them know I'm with you in that valley. I'm with you in that hollow place. I'm with you in that darkness. You are the myrtle trees that are putting forth a fragrant smell. You are the rare people of God. Hallelujah, victory and mercy and good words and words of comfort is coming from God tonight. And why is it? Because he said, I'm jealous for you. Amen. Woo. Now, what does that mean when it says jealous? It means he's got a burning zeal for what belongs to him. Let me put it to you this way. He is a passionate God. I said, when he says he's jealous, he's got a passion that's on fire for his people. And you ought to be on fire for him. You ought to have a passion for God. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, I love you, Jesus. In verse 15. And I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're at ease. Come on. And God says, I'm not happy with the nations because of the way they treated my people. Say amen. God says, I was but a little displeased. And, of course, we know that God corrected it, right? But the problem is they took it too far. The things that God meant to be used to be corrective, to be for their good, to not, not to be destructive. We see the heathen, and this is what they always do. They always take it too far. And so God says, I was displeased. I was a little displeased. But you enjoyed afflicting my people. You didn't understand that, that whenever I used you to be a chastisement for my people, you weren't supposed to enjoy that. But you enjoyed afflicting them. Oh, come on, somebody. And God says, you went too far. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And so we see in verse 16, oh, hallelujah to the Lamb. You know, I believe there's a time when God will stand up like that and say, enough's enough. You, you've pushed it too far. You, you've gone too far with this. Huh? Come on, he'll, put a, he'll draw a line. That's it. That's it. I believe it. But he said, they help forward the affliction, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem. How? With mercies. With mercies. He's coming in supernatural power 
to help his people. He's coming in supernatural power to bring victory to failures. He's coming with supernatural power to meet with the myrtle trees in the hollow place. He's coming there to bring victories to his house. He's coming to bring victory to his church. He's coming to overthrow false authority. He's coming as the true authority. He's coming to say, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Give God worship in the house. In verse 16, therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts. And a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. He said, my house. That's, of course, the future. uh, uh, The temple in those days and the temple in the future, of course, in the nation of Israel. But right now, you are the temple of God as well. Cry yet, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, my cities through what? Prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. And the Lord shall yet comfort Zion. And shall yet choose Jerusalem. God is saying, You're chosen. Amen. The background, verses one through six, failure. But you're still chosen. Oh, give God praise in the house. Put it under the blood. Go forward. Be victorious in your God. Know that God is not done with you. Go for it in victory and build, build, build. Man, I feel God in this place. Let's look at another passage here in Isaiah 55 and 13. I'm going to let you go. Isaiah 55, 13. I'm preaching to myrtles tonight in hollow places. I'm preaching victory to this house tonight. In Jesus' name, would you give your awesome God a hand clap of praise? Verse 13. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fur. Hmm. Holy Ghost just make sure that you see, keep on praying. Let me let me say this to you. Just the Holy Ghost just hit me with something. I saw somebody out there. If you think your pastor's just looking for you in the prayer room. He's not. God is looking for you. And he said, where have you been? I want you to stand and I want you to worship this awesome God. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree and it shall be the Lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Father, I thank you for your spirit. I thank you, Jesus, for your presence in this house. Amen. Oh, Jesus. Not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. 